one thing Americas and I have in common is clearly great photographers. If you need references for photographers, come find us. We will hook you up. <laughs> the other thing is I didn't realize that purple was the theme of the day, but this was pointed out to me. The other theme of the day, and this was not planned, is cats. You will see why in a minute. <laughs> now, I want to talk to you about the role played by analogical reasoning in bringing about the 2008 mortgage crisis. To do this, I first have to tell you what analogical reasoning is. So these slightly pixelated little boys are an excellent example of analogical reasoning. Right? The boy on the right does not know what a lion cub is. The boy on the left can help his friend out by leveraging an analogy we've all used. Right? A lion is a big cat. If you want to know what a lion cub is, it's a big kitten. Now, you are sitting there going, I am a Wharton undergraduate. How can this analogical reasoning, one of these psychological processes, possibly be of any help to me? And one way and one place where analogical reasoning is frequently used is in launching new products. Many of you will come up with innovations. Many of you will start new companies. And you will have to try to explain to people who are very busy, right, venture capital investors, Hollywood producers, what it is that's in your head. What analogical reasoning allows you to do is to speed up the pace of that communication. Now, imagine it's the 1990s, and you have come up with the idea for Disney's Lion King. right? It's not Disney's yet. You are trying to explain to Hollywood producers what this image of Simba that's in your head, very clear to you, but they don't have the time to read the script. So analogical reasoning to the rescue, here is how you can explain this in 30 seconds or less. Simba is Hamlet meets Jungle Book with a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> You've just turned 175 pages worth of script into something you can pitch in an elevator. This is analogical reasoning in a nutshell. In fact, Analogical reasoning is so important that some cognitive psychologists have credited analogical reasoning with how we are different from chimpanzees. Now, the gentleman on the left here, does anybody know who this is? James Watson, very good, the discoverer of DNA. So far, I have told you about how analogical reasoning can help you sell your ideas once you already have them. It turns out that if you go into laboratories where scientists try to come up with the next big thing, you know, mapping the human genome, discovering DNA, they frequently reason by analogies. They use analogies to discover things, to c discuss things with other scientists. Again, it's the same principle at work. Something's in my head, you are not in my head, and I need a quick way to communicate this something to you. Now, the next reasonable question you should be asking yourself is what on earth does this wonderful process for selling innovations, for coming up with innovations, have to do with the mortgage crisis? To answer this question, I'm going to take you back to the 1960s when mortgage-backed securities were first authorized in this country by an act of the United States Congress. And what happened in the 1960s is most mortgage lending in the United States worked like this. You're a mortgage banker. You need to decide whether to give somebody a loan. You call up Fannie Mae, which at the time is a government agency, and they get to vote yes or no. If they say no, you do not give the loan. If they say yes, you can sell this loan directly to the federal government. In fact, all American mortgages in the 1960s were part of the federal debt. And there are some similarities in the 1960s to the situations we face today. The federal government really wanted to get out of the mortgage business. Right? They didn't want to have mortgages. They didn't want to have this debt show up on the balance sheet. And if you were a mortgage banker in this situation, you literally faced an existential crisis. If you didn't come up with a different source of money to have these loans originated, you were out of business. So this was the crisis they were facing. And the way they tried to get their way out of the crisis is by analogy. 
they look to the bond market, where pension funds and life insurance companies, investors with long-term investment horizons, parked their money. And this analogy from mortgages to bonds became their solution. Most of us do not think of mortgages and bonds having very much in common. So when I came across this piece of reasoning in the data, I was a bit surprised. Let me give you just a, one piece of evidence that I've seen for this hypothesis, for this analogical reasoning hypothesis. What is a mortgage-backed security? If you asked folks in the late 1960s and early 70s, a mortgage-backed security transforms a mortgage into a bond. This was very strange. Stranger still, there were all kinds of reasons to believe that mortgages and bonds are different, right? Mortgage-backed securities, when they were launched, were quite different from bonds along a number of dimensions. And yet, <coughs> the bond investors focused on only one of these dimensions. The dimension has a strange title of prepayment risk. Now, part of my industry background here was working in late stage subprime collections. And so let me tell you the one thing I was not worried about, this was not keeping me up at night, is the problem that some of my clients will pay me back too fast. <laughs> I assure you that this, is, this was not one of the things keeping me up at night. So why were these bond investors, who seemed like smart people, why were they worried about being paid back too fast? Let me run you through a quick example. Let's say, do, is Max still here? Max? Let's say Max, <laughs> sorry, we, we're just keeping this up. Max has a brilliant business idea. And he needs some capital. So he goes to Kasha and says, look, I have a great investment opportunity for you. All I need you to do is lend me $10,000 and this opportunity is so big, I am going to pay you back $2,000 worth of interest. Right? This seems like a good deal. Kasha, being a nice person, says, sure, that, that seems like it'll work. But Kasha is facing some liquidity constraints of her own. So she turns around, she turns to her friend, whose name is? Jane. She turns to Jane, and she says, Jane, I have a great opportunity for you. Max has a great business idea. I lend him $10,000, he's going to pay me back $2,000 worth of interest. And I, being a good friend and a good person, am willing to sell you this for $1,000. No. Right, so, so far, everybody's happy. Max can finance his great business. Kasha just made $1,000. You know, and Jane is expecting this interest payment to come in. So far, things are good. But imagine that next day, Max just so happens to win the lottery. So instead of getting these interest payments to happen, he turns to Kasha and says, you've been such a great friend. Here is your $10,000. Thanks very much. We're done. Who is not happy in this situation? Why is Jane not happy? She's out $1,000, right? And basically what the bond investors were telling to people who were trying to sell mortgage-backed securities is we don't want to play Jane in this situation. We know how the story goes. We know this is real. We don't want to play. And for the first 15 years of mortgage-backed securities existence, they would play this game. The mortgage bankers would come up with some way of measuring prepayment risk or managing prepayment risk, come to bond investors, ask, does this work? The bond investors would say, no, this does not work. See you guys later. We don't play this game. And literally, this process went on for 15 years. Now, finally. In 1983, Freddie Mac introduced a new type of mortgage-backed security that tranched, that sliced the prepayment patterns. The idea being, I have different investors with different appetites for prepayment risk. Right? You can imagine somebody a little bit younger wanting to keep their money invested longer, and this being less of a problem for folks who didn't need to have this long investment horizon. And what they said was, the first group of investors will be hit with all the prepayment risk. And they will be compensated for this risk. But the second and the third groups of investors will be protected, as long as the principle of the first group of investors is not prepaid. And this was a wild success. 
Between 1983 and 1994, we've seen every type of collateralized mortgage obligation imaginable. These things had 69 tranches, they had surety wraps, they had you know, hash and jump diffusion models built up to support this tranching system. And as far as the bond investors were concerned, this was fixed. Right? The mortgage backed securities no longer had prepayment risk. And you know, if you are a mortgage banker in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, you would think that you have done everything you set out to do. You had a problem. You solved it by analogical reasoning. You wanted to finance your mortgages. You can finance your mortgages. You wanted pension funds to invest in these bond type securities. You have pension funds investing. And you would think this is a good time to rest on your laurels, or if you believe Michael Lewis's accounts, go play some golf. <laughs> and this is my evidence for analogical reasoning playing an important part in bringing about the 2008 mortgage crisis. Instead of resting on their laurels, the analogy here takes on a life of its own. So instead of saying everything is great, once prepayment risk is taken care of, this triggers a new round of comparisons along the default risk dimension between mortgage-backed securities and bonds. Now, up until this point, up until the early 90s, Mortgage-backed securities have no default risk. Anybody who falls behind on their payments, that money gets replaced by the federal government because all mortgage-backed securities in the early 90s are guaranteed by the federal government. Right. And you know, to most of us who don't work in financial markets, this seems like a good idea. Right? You have a security, it has no risk, this is great. However, this is why we don't work in financial markets. Because if you do work in financial markets, you think adding risk to securities is a good idea. Why is it ever a good idea to add risk to securities? Wharton undergraduates, you should know this. <laughs> right, you can get higher yields. Higher risk gets you higher yields. The other piece of the puzzle here is the federal government actually charges them money for guaranteeing the loans to the tune of about 25 basis points on a mortgage, which adds up to quite a bit of change. The third piece is that federal government actually constrains the type of mortgages they could and could not write. So here, they, they're looking at the upside of higher yields, at saving money on government guarantee fees, and the reason they think this is sort of their free lunch is because they now have this risk management tool called tranching, which in theory protects them from all these types of risk for free. So here I have my no in quotes because this was the perception of the bond investor. Here the no is not in quotes because they did in fact successfully introduce lots of default risk into mortgage-backed securities. Now, a question that many of you are asking yourself is what happens when tranching does not work, right? What happens then? And in fact, in 1994, we have this nice thought experiment that somebody actually ran for us in real time. In 1994, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates between 91 and 93 so much that every homeowner in America who has access to a mortgage loan refinances their loan. So that means all those investors in these senior tranches of mortgage-backed securities who thought they were protected by tranching, all of a sudden watches the interest component of their mortgage-backed security holding wiped out. And again, let me go back to the analogy we started with. You have the solution, mortgage-backed securities becoming bonds, that's predicated on the idea that tranching works, right? Until we came up with tranching, no bond investor would contemplate investing into mortgage-backed securities. Right? So a logical thing to do, if we have clear evidence that tranching does not work, would be to revisit the analogy. Now, as many of you know, absolutely no such thing happened. Right? The analogy emerges unscathed, and the whole episode 
is portrayed as technical difficulties. You know, our tools have some issues, we'll work on them. And not only is there no reevaluation of this analogy, but they sort of double down on the bet that mortgage backed securities actually work. They change their name, the name of their professional association, you know, to America's discussion of branding, to the Bond Market Association. Not only do we not revise beliefs, we double down on bad bets. And you know, the next phase you guys are all familiar with, what happens when tranching does not work again? Between 94 and 2008, these guys don't just change their brand identity. They continue offering riskier and riskier loans to all comers. Because they think that at least the investors in this picture are protected from the default risk. And 2008 becomes the rude awakening. Right? It turns out that the lesson they could have learned in 1994 but didn't comes back again. Those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. Right? Except for there is a small difference, and this actually is what drives my, reach, my interest in this topic. The small difference is in 1994, when the mortgage market, back securities market melted down, all the ha that happened is some very wealthy people lost some money. In 2008, you have five million families facing foreclosure. That's a population of several medium European countries <laughs> who just got kicked out of their homes. You have people in Arizona, you have people in California, you have people in Florida, you have people in Nevada living in conditions most of us would not contemplate if, if not given another choice. We have people living in parking lots. We have families, five families crammed into a single motel room in Florida. And one of the things that drives my interest in this topic is where is the public outrage? Right? In the Great Depression, the pictures of these people would have been in the newspapers. And today, you know, if every three months the Huffington Post has something somewhere on the lower sidebar, that's all we get. Now, I'm not mentioning the Great Depression as kind of a sidebar. As I was giving this talk to academic audiences, I actually got asked, how do we know five million families is a bad thing? Right? How do we know that the fact that five million families have lost their homes is bad? How bad is it? The blip on the right-hand side is the Great Depression. This is where we are now. And just to be clear, the data series are foreclosures on non-farm residential properties in the United States as percentage of total mortgages outstanding. This is where the mortgage-backed securities get introduced. And this is where you have five million families facing foreclosure. Now, this chart is many things. It's not a causal statement of what happened. But I think you know, it's a nice lesson about the power of analogical reasoning. Analogical reasoning can help you come up with ideas. It can help you sell ideas. It is no guarantee that the ideas that are spread by analogical reasoning are good. Thank you. <laughs>